The corona pandemic is intensifying, and nothing is the same. Will society return to its former self, or are we now living in a new world order? Opinions differ, for better or worse. My name is Henrik Jönsson, and I'm an independent, libertarian entrepreneur and societal commentator. An increasing number of nations are now closing their borders and enforcing acute quarantine in order to slow the spread of the virus. How has the world historically reacted to major pandemics? What are the consequences for both society and the world economy? And how does one handle this new situation as a private citizen? These are some of the questions that I raise in this week's video. Do you appreciate my videos? If you do, I'd be grateful if you'd support me using one of the payment options to my left. My videos take between two and three full working days to produce every single week and I cannot continue making them without your continued financial support. Big thanks to those of you who are already supporting my video production. Also, do not forget to hit the subscribe button down below if you have not already done so, and make sure to select all when hitting that infernal bell icon so that you just might get notified when I release new videos, which I do with relentless discipline every Wednesday. Today, we're talking about epidemics, economics, and entropy. Stay tuned! Pathogens, in other words, bacteria, viruses, and dangerous microorganisms, have all been man's companion since the dawn of time. In fact, every living thing constantly wages a fight for adaptation and survival, which is earned solely through resilience and adaptability. H. G. Wells' novel War of the Worlds from 1898 was written during the height of a cholera epidemic, 30 years prior to modern antibiotics being invented, and in a period where Darwinistic natural selection was still palpable. Survival of the fitness, boys! The ill-prepared Martians in Wells' book arrived with superior technology in order to enslave the population of the Earth, but eventually failed due to their immune systems not being adapted to the microbiota of Earth. The Martians had no resistance to the bacteria in our atmosphere to which we have long since become immune. Once they had breathed our air, germs which no longer affect us began to kill them. Just like the Martians, Viruses and humans are also fighting for survival, and we are constantly trying to adapt in order to beat each other in this game. A powerful illustration of this is how more and more microbes are now gradually developing so-called antibiotic resistance and become immune to the treatments people in modern times have started using in order to prevent diseases from gaining a foothold. In 2013, the World Health Organization declared that antibiotic resistance is considered a global security threat. Even in modern times, infectious diseases are still one of mankind's greatest enemies, and the World Health Organization's warning underscores the dependency of modern society on vaccines and antibiotics. There is still no vaccine to COVID-19, the disease that the coronavirus causes, and the infection requires intensive care to treat for those who become severely ill in order to get cured. In order to conserve the limited resources of intensive care units, measures resembling martial law are now increasingly adopted around the globe. Globalization is unique for our time. Never before have so many people been able to travel and work anywhere in the world so easily. This has unlocked tremendous prosperity. But it has also accelerated the spread of pathogens. The free market, global mobility and specialization has brought the world unmatched prosperity. But the dependency on a global supply system is also making us vulnerable. In 1958, political philosopher Leonard Reed published his famous essay I Pencil. The essay describes the infinite complexity and value of the free market by illustrating how no single individual is capable of producing even a single 
wooden pencil. The pencil is made from cedar wood from California, which requires logging machines, transportation and sawmills to manufacture. All these tools exist solely because of the talented craftsmen that invented them. The manufacturing of these tools demand access to raw materials such as iron, oil and energy. The so-called lead inside the pencil is made from graphite from Sri Lanka, which requires mining which in its turn depends on drilling machines, electrical lights and burlap for packaging. The graphite is then mixed with chemicals from different parts of the world and is later baked in ovens that somebody has built and somebody is operating. To strengthen the durability of the pencil, it is then furnished with six layers of animal paint, which is extracted from castor beans that someone in turn has farmed and refined. The rubber that through chemical processes gets turned into erasers is grown in Indonesia and the copper socket which keeps the eraser in place is mined in South American copper mines. As Reed shows us, the production of a single pencil involves thousands of people who are all part of an extremely complex self-generating supply chain mechanism. If the production of a simple pencil requires all this competence and all this trade, consider the miracle, the smartphone or computer you're using right now. Generations of expertise has created sophisticated factories that can produce computer processors, sliver-thin touchscreens and microscopic camera sensors, speakers and radio equipment with the capacity to communicate with satellites many kilometers above sea level, which in their turn connect you with computers all over the world of which some right now are transmitting a continuous stream of ones and zeros to your device which instantly translates them into this joyous dance of pixels that constitutes this video stream. Even calling this magnificent brilliance a miracle is an insult to the triumph of mankind, for it is only generation upon generation of diligently working individuals that has made it possible for us today to enjoy the extraordinary fruits of their combined struggles. Let us compare this teeming productivity with an anthill. In the seeming chaos, individuals are all pulling their own weight to add to the hill and thus contribute to maintaining and further developing their civilization. When politicians try to regulate the market, it can be compared to pushing a stick into the anthill. Chaos ensues for the ants, but eventually they find new ways to work around the hindrance that has been introduced. Push another couple of sticks into the hill and it might destroy vital parts of the anthill community, but the ants will move their eggs and keep finding new ways to keep going. Up to a point, because if the interference becomes too great, it will sooner or later make the ants abandon their hill to start anew in a location less prone to disturbances. Many of the drastic measures that are now being enforced in order to slow the pandemic can be compared not just to forcing all the ants to stay inside the anthill, but also to putting every single anthill under an airtight cover through which no new material can be added to their hills. Now, this is not a criticism of the measures now enforced in an attempt to curb the spread of the virus. It is just a reminder of the stakes because the entire economy of the world is right now in lockdown and a prolonged shutdown of the world economy will, with great probability, claim more lives than any pandemic ever could. The pandemic is just the first phase of this crisis. The upcoming and bigger crisis is social and economic. Many people are now practicing so-called social distancing, which basically means people are staying at home as much as possible. This is a reasonable strategy from the perspective of curbing the spread of the pandemic. But the financial system is hit by a domino effect. People staying at home means dropping productivity levels and dwindling demand for companies. Many of them are already laying off staff. The laid off become poor and can no longer contribute to the general economy. When people are poor and stay at home, restaurants go out of business with more layoffs as a consequence. 
farmers and commodity producers get fewer and fewer orders in turn. High street retail stores start closing. Events and shows get cancelled. Global economic activity begins to collapse. As a consequence, even more people are laid off and become poor. They then begin cutting down on their spending, which makes it even more difficult for the remaining businesses to keep going. This vicious circle practically describes a normal recession. But in this case, it is much, much worse. Because this crisis is the result of global, politically enforced pandemic measures. China dominates the world's manufacturing industry and has for a long time now operated at about 65% of their normal production capacity. So we get less plastic junk and fewer pirated electronic gadgets? You might shrug. Unfortunately, it's not that simple. Because all production is, as the example with the pencil shows, dependent on so-called supply chains. Even if you just run a local pizza place, you rely on packaging materials and produce from a wholesaler. The wholesaler, in turn, buys his or her products in volume from producers. The producers, in their turn, are dependent on a million different components, which are manufactured in China and in other countries. If there is a shortage of copper wires, memory chips and soybeans, there is eventually a shortage of almost everything in the entire world. Production and supply deficits are now systemic. But it is not yet noticeable for the consumer. This is due to a phenomenon called lead time. The concept lead time refers to the delay between the initiation of a process and when its consequences become apparent. For example, the time between a product no longer being produced and the time when the local warehouses run out of stock so that the product is no longer available to the consumers. This is lead time. As a responsible citizen, it is therefore wise to prepare for scarcity. And no, this does not mean that you need to bunker up on toilet paper, since paper manufacturing is actually one of the few remaining domestic industries that we still have going here in Sweden. The ongoing shutdown of the world economy is historically unique. It is therefore reasonable to assume that many people still live in the delusion that the authorities soon will sound the alarm and tell everyone that we're in the clear now. Let society return to a normal state of affairs. This will not happen because it is not possible. Man måste förstå att man kan inte stänga ner hela ekonomin och förvänta sig att den kommer tillbaka precis som det såg ut förut. The pandemic has not even peaked yet, and the economy is already in a freefall. Chaotic and authoritarian forces on all sides are now gearing up, where all questions are framed as dangerous disloyalty to the policies of the government, but where more and more governments are using the crisis as an excuse to strengthen control for a society. This is not a question about the right or the left wing, but about freedom and control where the desire for control can be compared with the desire of governments to push more sticks into the anthill of the productive market economy. The American scientist, politician and founding father Benjamin Franklin summarized the situation well with his quote, those who would give up essential liberty to purchase a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. Many people are going to die. Millions will lose their jobs. Hundreds of thousands of businesses are going to fail. At the same time as the infrastructure of society is overwhelmed and understaffed. Och det innebär ju också att alla företag de ägnar sig bara åt att skära kostnader, men de har ju inga inkomster överhuvudtaget. Så konsekvenserna är att arbetslösheten stiger sekund för sekund. Det är massarbetslöshet. Det handlar om arbetslöshet på 20 procent till 40 procent. Det innebär att ingen, det finns väldigt få verksamheter att gå till. It is not unlikely that entire countries are going to default. For example, the Italian banking system is already teetering on the brink of disaster, and every hour it becomes more and more expensive for Italy to keep borrowing money to keep fighting the pandemic. If Italy fails, the euro fails. 
As a consequence, the entire EU will enter a great financial depression. In both Sweden and the US, and in many other countries as well, financial support programs are therefore now being rolled out. Det krispaket som vi kan presentera idag, det kan komma att omfatta över 300 miljarder kronor om hela likviditetsförstärkningen utnyttjas. And he will ask for a total of 850 billion dollars to deal with the economic fallout from the coronavirus. These support programs are unfortunately like trying to put out a wildfire with a super soaker due to the simple fact that the crisis is global and its cost cannot be covered by national initiatives. The current pandemic crisis is by no means unique for our time. And in the wake of crisis follows great social, financial and political reform. To illustrate this, I have compiled a short overview of historical pandemics. The first documented pandemic took place during the Peloponnesian War, roughly 430 BC. Smallpox spread through Libya, Ethiopia and Egypt and eventually found its way into Athens, which was under siege by the Spartans. This resulted in the demise of two-thirds of the Athenian population. As a consequence, Athens lost its protectionist monopoly in the Aegean Sea. The pandemic was horrible, but it contributed to the collapse of the trade monopoly, which in its turn led to a prosperity increase in the entire Greek world. When the plague made its way through Europe in the 14th century, somewhere between 30 to 60% of the population of Europe died. This led to acute labor shortages in the agrarian English economy, which in its turn made the value of land collapse while the value of labor rose. As a consequence, the feudal system collapsed and was gradually replaced with private ownership, which generated the productivity gains that made way for both the Renaissance and the Age of Enlightenment. The epidemic of malaria that ravaged the Catholic Church in the beginning of the 17th century resulted in Pope Urban VII demanding a cure. This led to the discovery of quinine, a muscle-relaxing compound extracted from the bark of the quinchona tree. Quinine proved effective in combating the spread of malaria. The discovery was revolutionary, and for a time, quinine was valued higher than gold. This generated massive trade, encouraged further travel, and the spread of malaria was curbed. In the beginning of the 19th century, the soldiers of the British East India Company mixed their bitter quinine tonic with gin and lime in order to make their anti-malaria medicine more palatable. The malaria pandemic was and is horrible, but it also contributed to the pushback of the disease and it created the cocktail, gin and tonic. These historic examples are not meant to trivialize the horrors of the pandemics that humanity has had to suffer. However, it is wise to remember that disruptive times also make for abundant opportunities for those who can think clearly and have some entrepreneurial courage. If life gives you lemons, make lemonade. When life gives you lemonade, make lemons. Life will be all like, what? So goes a perky piece of advice popularized by American super entrepreneur Dale Carnegie. The suggestion is to turn something sour into something sweet. My own advice is why make lemonade when a lemon just as well can become a battery and spread light? It is always darkest just before dawn. As a social commentator in these difficult times, it is easy to be accused of passive moaning and complaining. I am therefore now examining the possibility of launching some form of training for those who are or want to become entrepreneurs in the midst of this new chaos and who want to make the world a better place. Is this you? Follow the link marked Accent in the description below to sign up for information on this as it develops. My name is Henrik Jönsson and I see opportunity in hardship. Take care of each other out there. Thank you very much for watching this video.